be in church. Be in church. Why am I saying that? Because I'm the pastor and it just makes me feel validated when you're all here. No, I'm beyond that. I, I'm, I don't say that boastfully, but honestly, I'm, I'm past it. I'm past that. I know who I am in Christ, and I know what I'm called to do, and I know where my anointing's at, and I don't need anybody to validate me anymore. There was a time when I felt very insecure if nobody showed up, but you know what? Not today. I'm going to, I'm going to say what the Lord places on my heart, and if it, if it offends, I'm sorry. I don't want to be the cause of offense, but if I'm teaching the truth of the word and it offends, it's not me that offended you. Right? All right. And there's a reason why I'm saying this. Because I really feel, I really feel this is what the Spirit of the Lord is speaking to the church. Not just this church, the corporate body of Christ in this hour. Because I feel that it's very, very crucial yes. that we get this. Yes. Hebrews 10.25 not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another. What's that mean? When we come together, look around you. You see these people? You see these people? We ought to know them. You ought to know the people you go to church with. You ought to know their name. You ought to know a little something about them. You ought to be willing to help them in whatever way you can. Exhort them. If it's just a kind word. Because you don't know really what they're dealing with. Because the truth is when we come here, we got our church face on. And everything's okay. But it's not always. You know, a lot of times we come here and we see each other and we don't even realize, man, they're hurting. They're going through hell right now. They got a kid that's just acting stupid, just went plum nuts. They're dealing with things that maybe you can't even fathom. You don't know. You don't know what they're struggling with. So when we come together, we ought to exhort each other. Hey, is there something I can help you with? Is there something you need? Is there something I can do for you? Do you need do you need to be praying need to be praying for you? Because the truth is, somebody in here probably just went through it, whatever you're dealing with. But if we don't come together, and he, he didn't just say gather, he said assemble. And I've taught on that pretty extensively, right? Because there's a huge difference in gathering and assembling. And if you don't know the difference, think back to that time when you put that kid's swing set together on Christmas Eve. And all the parts were gathered. But were they assembled? assembled? No. There's a big difference between gathered and assembled. A, a gathered just means grouped together. Assembled means fit, joined, connected, everyone doing their part. What's your part in the church? It's not just coming to church, it's being the church. What's your role? If, if you come here, and if you've been here more than twice, if this is your first time, Hey, you're a visitor. We welcome you. But if it's not, what's your role? Where's, where, where does this gifting that God's placed in me, where does it fit? How do I operate in it? How can I be utilized? How can I be mobilized? All right. It says, and so much more as you see the day. And God made an emphasis there. He, he, that's capitalized because he put an emphasis there. The day approaching. As you see the day approaching. What's that day? That's the biggest day that the world will ever know is that day. The only one that even rivals it is when God said, light be. But even that is going to pale to that day. That's when Jesus comes back. That day. He said, make sure you're assembled. 
Make sure you're in church, you're being the church, you found your role, you're active, you're connected, you're joined together, you've, you're fitted and secure. Make sure. Don't forsake it as some have. Exhort one another. And so much more. It's so much more important as you see the day approaching. And the day's approaching. The day's approaching. The day of Jesus' return is getting near. When's it going to be? I've been hearing that all my life. Yeah, me too. <laughs> but look around. But look around. Look, you don't have to be spiritual to understand that some things are changing. You don't ever even have to have opened your Bible. You can be completely numb to the things of God. And you can look around and say, man, something's going on. Mm -hmm. There's been a shift. There's been a change. Because we're so much more near the day than we ever have been. And I want you to analyze what's going on in our world. You think it's not important that we assemble? Why is there such an attack against our <coughs> assembly? If it wasn't crucial that we assemble, why would there be such a demonic attack on our assembly? I want you to understand, it's not the Democrats. It's not Nancy Pelosi. It's not the governor. It's not who's in the White House. It's a spiritual thing. It's the kingdom of darkness against the kingdom of light. And we're in the middle. And there's a struggle in the atmosphere for power. There's a power struggle going on. And we're in the middle. And we're the ones with dominion. Or we should be. The reason, I'm going to go back to what I said a while ago about man having dominion on the earth and it takes a man to do something for the supernatural to happen. That's why even demonic spirits look for a body to possess. Mm -hmm. Because without that, they have no authority here. Jesus went and dealt with a, a, a demon-possessed man in the Gadarenes. He crossed the, the Sea of Galilee to get, you remember the man in the tombs? And he comes out screaming, Son of God, why did you come to torment me before the day? And he says, shut up and come out in the Brian version. The new Brian Living Trans version. Trans Trans version. <laughs> shut up and come out. And the, the, the demons say, what? Yeah, we're many and all that. But then they say, well, wait. At least let us go where? Into the pigs. Because the pigs even have a right to be here. But we don't. I, I'm going to avoid that rabbit trail. But I just want to make that point. So we're stuck in this power struggle between darkness and light. And in the middle of that is our assembly. And the, 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 the kingdom of darkness is adamantly against our ability to assemble. Right? In direct opposition and doing everything they can to break us apart. Why? Because there's power in unity. When we come together, there's power here. Where any two or more are gathered in my name, I'm there. Where any two or more agree, it's touching anything, it's done. Even God, let us make man in our image. Who's he talking to? Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. God's talking to himself, and he says, let us. But there's third three. There was unity. Do you understand what I'm saying? There's power in unity. And the kingdom of darkness knows if he can separate us and fragment us and break us up, we become weaker and weaker. It's not the government. They may be being used, but recognize the spirit behind it. And it's all about that. Because here's the truth. The truth is there's no safer place on earth than in the presence of the Holy Spirit.
There's no safer place in the world than under the anointing. That's the safest place you can be. Understand that there's a struggle. Understand it's between light and darkness. It's not what we think. It's not what we think. It's not Democrat or Republican. It's light and darkness. As the day approaches, the return of Jesus, as it draws near, for some, that's going to be the most wonderful day ever. But overall, that's going to be the darkest day the world has ever known. That's going to be the most horrific day. Because you know, the truth is, most aren't going to make it. That's the truth. I wish I could say otherwise, but the truth is that most aren't. I pray my family does. I pray that those who sit under our ministry do. I pray that out there, there's those that I've reached that will make it. But the truth is, there's a lot that aren't. And that's going to be, Pastor Mike Neely said, the flood of Noah is going to look like a drizzle, like a rain shower compared to that day. So Jesus is saying, or Paul here is by the Spirit of God saying, as that day gets closer, it's going to become more and more important that you don't allow yourself to be removed from the body. <clears throat> Your adversary, the devil, goes out as a roaring lion, seeking who he may devour. How does a lion hunt? Does he just run right up into a herd of buffalo and jump on one? No, he's going to isolate one. He's going to cut one out of the herd somehow. He's going to separate them. Because in that middle of that herd, there's safety for the buffalo. But when they get isolated, it's over. So your adversary, the devil, does just like that and tries to separate one from the herd. Tries to, sep tries to get one detached. And when they do, As the coming of the Lord approaches, it becomes more and more, more, more and more, more and more difficult to continue to follow Christ. Pay attention. It becomes more and more difficult to be a follower of Jesus, but it's not an immediate thing for most. It's a gradual. It's the, it's the frog in the in the pot of water theory. You know, you, they say you put the frog, frog in the pot of water and you can just turn up the heat and because the water gradually gets warmer, he doesn't notice he's boiling. But it was just gradual incremental change. And I can see that happening in the body of Christ. It's just a slow regression. And we don't even notice it because it's so subtle. And before you know it, you look back over your life and you think, how did I get here? Matthew 24, 3 through 14. Now as he, capital H, this is Jesus, sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Lord, now Jesus has been talking about this day, Right? Jesus has been talking about the day. And he's been talking about it to, to the masses. Now, when they get alone and, it, it, alone, and it's just Jesus and the disciples, they come to him and they say, Lord, all this stuff you've been talking about, when's this going to happen? And how are we going to know when the day is getting close? Man, listen to what Jesus says. Tell us, they said, when these things will be and what will be the sign of your coming. And of the end of the age. And Jesus answered them, said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you. What did Jesus start with? Deception. Take heed that you're not deceived. Don't, 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 don't let them come in and subtly, just subtly deceive you. This, is deception ever done in the open? No, it's hidden. You 
You ever watch people do magic? They don't let you see what was really taking place. It's a cover-up, right? There's a cover-up of what really happened, and then you go, wow, how did he do that? I never saw him. But somehow they did it. Don't be deceived. Take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come. How? In my name. Saying I am the Christ. Have we ever seen that? And that's been going on all my life. And it usually leads to the destruction of a lot of people. But it's gradual. No one, all, all of those cult leaders that, that got those people to kill themselves, they didn't come in there one day, get a bunch of people and say, hey, let's all go kill ourselves. <laughs> How many people would have followed them? Nobody. They had probably dealt with them. But when it's gradual, and it's a little bit, it's a little bit, you know, those child predators, most of them, Work, I say most of a lot of them will work on that child gaining their trust for years before they ever try anything. That's sick. But it's a gradual, it's a gradual earning of trust slowly. Sounds just like the devil. It's a gradual thing. Many will come saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. And you will hear wars, hear wars and rumors of war. You ever heard of that? Has that happened in your life? Yeah. That there's been wars and threats of other ones? Yeah. See that you're not troubled. Jesus put that in there. See that you're not troubled. Because we sing about our hope is in you, Lord. Right? Our hope is in you. Then why do we get so troubled when who we didn't think was going to win the presidency won? Why do we get so troubled if my hope is in God? For all these things must come to pass. But the end's not yet. Because before the end, Nation will have to rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. Nation against king, a nation against nation, natural. Kingdom against kingdom. Kingdom of darkness. Kingdom of light. Do we see it happening? And there will be famines. And here's an interesting one. Pestilence. You know what pestilence is? Uncurable diseases, plagues, pandemics. That's what a pestilence is. And Jesus said, Jesus said, when you start seeing these things happen, pay attention. Pay attention. When you see them happen, don't forsake the assembling of yourself together. Earthquakes in various places. Places that never had earthquakes. Now they have them. See it all the time. All these things are the beginning of sorrow. Then, with it, then they'll deliver you up to tribulation and they'll kill you. And you'll be hated by all the nations for my name's sake. Maybe in this country we haven't really started, they haven't really started killing Christians. But if you look globally, go ahead and speak about, about Jesus in some of these other countries and they'll kill you and nobody even think twice about it. And it's coming here quickly. You could have said that a few years ago when Americans would have said to me, never. But look what goes on. You think Christians are hated in this country? When they polled our politicians some time back, and asked them what they thought about Christianity, the overwhelming majority said it was people who were mentally disturbed. 
and they want to stamp it out and remove Christianity from every fiber of this country. And I said politicians are not the enemy. That doesn't come from them. They didn't conjure that up. But they got a spirit whispering in their ear. But Jesus said, when, when, when they start hating you for what you believe, for my name's sake, you ought to pay attention because the end's drawn near. And watch this next one. And then many will be offended. Oh, dear God. Have you run across anyone offended? <laughs> you can offend somebody. Man, you don't have to do much. I've probably offended someone on there already. Because if I speak the truth, it's going to offend someone. If you really want to be offensive, say what God says. But it's okay when you offend someone by saying what God says because it's not you that offended them. It's God. So now their problem, they can't take it up with you. You say, ah, just talk to him. Stop it. Well, I want to dwell on that one for quite a while. Make sure you're not the one that's easily offended because offense will destroy you. When you allow yourself to be offended, man, it's hard, going to be hard for you to go forward. And when you're offended, you become bitter. And that's contagious. And now nobody's going to want to be around you except other offended people. Now that's toxic because now you've got agreement. And now you can really do some destruction because there's power and agreement. Make sure you don't get offended. It's okay to get your feelings hurt. I get my feelings hurt all the time. Don't look at me like that. I get my feelings hurt easy. I really do. But I can't allow myself to become offended. There's a difference. Because when you, when you get your feelings hurt, you want somebody to bring healing when you get offended, you want to hurt somebody. There's a difference there. If I'm hurt, I want to heal. If I'm offended, I want to hurt. Okay? Many will be offended and will betray one another and will hate one another. You know, the interesting thing about betrayal, it doesn't come through your enemy. Betrayal comes through a trusted friend. Because it, the expectation is for your enemy to do you wrong, but you don't expect your trusted friend to do you wrong. That's when it's betrayal. You don't expect someone you trusted to turn on you. That's when it becomes a betrayal. Betrayal, but the, the Lord said in the last day that... We're going to see betrayal rampant. Do you see betrayal rampant? Who is faithful anymore? And hate one another. There's never been a time when there's been more hatred. You know, we, we're tomorrow's Martin Luther King Day, and that's what that man lived for, was to, to, to do away with that to try to get us to move forward from that. <clears throat> I think there are others that have taken the groundwork that he established and went the wrong direction with it. But what he intended to do was right and good. And just by saying that, somebody will be offended. And just let them be. What does division do? It creates hatred. It creates betrayal and hatred. So God said don't be divided. Be in unity. Because where there's unity, there's love. 
Does it mean you always get along? No. But you'll love each other. So when we're in unity, I'm going to have a love for you, and you're going to have a love for me, and we're going to work some things out. But if we get divided, hatred will jump in the middle of us. And I'll become offended with you, you'll become offended with me, and we'll hate each other. And sometimes two groups of people will hate each other, and they don't even know why. True. In our day and time right now, the world, this, this world, and you're in it, and the church is in it, but we're being divided into groups. And what happens now, they sow discord in between them because they'll say so, such and such did this and such and such did that. And they said this and they believe this way. And it may, not, may or may not even be the truth. But now both parties are offended and they hate each other. And we're being broken apart. We're being fragmented and separated by our hatred toward each other where we can't even come together anymore and join hands and pray together in unity. Just saying. It's just an observation I made. But do you see? Do you see that we're being fragmented and then the gaps are being filled with hatred? How do we get to, how do we get to a place of unity? Then many false prophets, prophets, many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. Have you seen it? <coughs> I don't even watch Christian television anymore. I turn it off. I'm a pastor. I shouldn't say things like that, right? I don't watch it. Because somehow in the church, We've replaced the truth of the gospel with some message that doesn't even look like the one Jesus taught. And it, it, doesn't, even, it doesn't even point you to the cross. Because I don't want to tell somebody that they have to repent because they could be offended, dear God. They may not like me anymore. So I'm just going to tell you, I'm going to pat you on the back and I'm going to tell you, God loves you just like you are. Well, there's truth in that. He loves you, but he loves you so much he don't want you to stay that way. He wants you to come to the cross and kneel at the cross and say, God, I need a Savior. Heal me. I've sinned. Forgive me. But where in Christian ease do we speak that language anymore? So I just turn it off. I I'll, I'll, I'll watched a well-known pastor of a very large church get on there the other day and speak for 30 minutes and I watched it and I was intrigued because he quoted everyone from Thomas Jefferson to, to Abraham Lincoln to Mother Teresa to all these people and never once quoted Jesus. I'm thinking how sad. This man had a brain that could remember things that I would love to have. How about remember the word of God? It's got a, the power to set the captive free and the power to save the lost. Yeah, the things that they said were good, but they weren't God. <coughs> False prophets deceiving many. You know, if you're going to poison someone, you don't say, here's a glass of poison, drink it up. So what do, what do you do? You fix something that's good and you mix a little bit of poison. And they drink it and the poison goes unnoticed and they ask for another glass. So, so much of or the majority of what false prophets will say will be true. But there's just enough theory, there's ju just enough fallacy mixed in with it to create a toxic environment. Just like what I just demonstrated with her. Jesus loves you just the way you are. There's some truth in that. That's, that is true. But the whole truth is he don't want you to stay that way. Now let me lead you to the cross. But if we just leave it at that, then you get a false sense of security. And when that day comes, you don't make it. Get in your Bible. Get in your Bible. Read the Word of God. Know the Word of God for yourself. Don't trust me. Don't trust anyone else to tell you what God said when you have the ability to find out for yourself. Because if you don't know for yourself, if you don't study for yourself, if you don't read for yourself, you're setting yourself up to be deceived. Amen. Amen. That's right, man. 
And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. I just want to throw this book in there and walk out of the room. Because lawlessness abounds, the love of many grows cold. What happens to us when we turn on the TV and we see the lawlessness? If there's a fiber of morality in us, we want to rebel against it. But what happens? We don't do it the right way. We get mad and we blame them and we say all these things and now our love has grown cold. You know what I'm saying. And we can target a specific group and say it's all about, it's all because of them. And it's not. That same person that we want to say it's all their fault is the same person Jesus hung on a cross for. And if we can't love them in spite of what they did, then we missed it. And I don't want to stand before God when he says, why didn't you love them? And I say, because God, you saw everything they did. He said, yeah, but I saw everything you did, and I loved you anyway. <laughs> yeah. Lawlessness will abound. It will cause the love of many to grow cold. Don't let yourself be there. Is our country going to pot when it concerns law lawfulness? Yeah. Is there a lot of lawlessness? Yeah. But don't let that cause your love to grow cold. And don't let it consume your heart with fear. <clears throat> But he who endures to the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom, it'll be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations. And then the end will come. And then the end will come. And then the day comes. We're on the doorstep of the day. We're right on the cusp of the day. And God said... Don't forsake the assembling of yourself together when you see the day drawing near because you're going to need it more then than ever. And look, I love the technology that we have that we can literally reach millions of people through that. Don't let that replace church. Don't let that replace church. Because you might sit at home and say, man, that's a good message. And take notes and everything and miss the anointing that's present when the body of Christ comes together. Amen. Because there's a corporate anointing when we come together. God does something that he can't do when we're fragmented. It's great when we can't be here. But it becomes a crutch to say, I don't need to go. I'll just watch it. I'm going to get off of that. So, in lieu of what Jesus said concerning how we know when the day is coming, does it sound familiar? Do you think we're getting close? So, when's he coming back? I would never dare to make that presumption because that would be foolishness. People have done that in the past. They all look like stupid people. Right? Just saying true. But I can say this. We've never been closer than we are today. Never been closer than we are today. Never been closer than we are today. So is he coming back today? I don't know. Is he coming back tomorrow? I don't know. Is he coming back in 2021? I don't know. But I can say this. The same things he told me to look for, they're all here. Don't get sucked into the drama. My next tattoo. <laughs> Don't get sucked into the drama. You will become deceived if you allow yourself to get sucked into the drama. You will allow yourself to become deceived You'll allow yourself, then you, you, you will transition into the offended if you get sucked in. 
And the bait's always dangling to get you sucked in. The bait's always right there just to suck you in like a vacuum into all the drama. You remember the day when if there was drama going on in your house, it's because it happened in your house? <laughs> now most of the drama takes place in our houses from people we don't even know. True? It's just something we saw on Facebook. <clears throat> and now there's all this drama going on in my life brought there by people I don't even know. You know what? I got enough drama in my own life. I don't need to acquire it from someone else. I don't need to share in it. I don't need to be a partaker of it. And look, I don't need to put mine out there so someone else can be offended with what I'm dealing with. Because now that's a third-party offense. <laughs> so look, if, if, if me and Matthew are having some issues, if we're having some husband and wife things that we got to work out, if I share that, you know what's going to happen? People are going to pick sides. And now they're offended with her because how she treated me. Or they're offended with, offended with me because of how I treated her. And here's the truth in it. Me and her, we're going to work it out. Because there's the grace of God that's going to come in and he's going to work in our relationship because we turn our hearts <coughs> to him and we're going to work it out. But what happens? Now there's still people out there that's offended with both of us and had nothing to do with it. And there's no healing for them because there's no grace for them because it was none of their concern. I'm just using this as a picture, but you can... You can fill in the gaps with anything. It's not just in relationships. It's with everything that happens. Don't get sucked in. Don't take the bait. And if you missed it on Facebook, all you got to do is turn on the news. And they're dangling bait. And they're dangling bait. And it looks so good, so I'm going to try it. Now I'm hooked. Now I'm offended. Now I'm offended. Because of something that they told me happened. And you know what? Truth is, it may not have even happened. And it sure didn't happen. Probably, it almost certainly didn't happen the way they told me it did. Yeah. Because the way they told me was trying to get me to conform to the image that they wanted me to look like. And they're really trying to separate. Why is the media so instrumental in the separation, in the division of the church? Why is the media so instrumental? Why is the media so instrumental in spreading fear? Why is the media so instrumental in spreading hate? Why is the media so instrumental in division? You know why? How do they communicate over the what? Air. And the devil's called the prince of the power of the air. You, you understand that. So be careful what you transmit and receive that goes through the air. Because somewhere between the mouth and the ear or the eye, it was probably twisted by a deceiver. Do you understand that? Why can you send someone a text message? I saw it done twice this week. Send someone a text message, completely well-meaning, and when they read it, they go, I can't believe they talked to me that way. <laughs> Twice I saw it this week. Well, the truth is they didn't. But somewhere between their pointer finger and your eyes, it was twisted. And the truth is you only read it with the attitude that you're in at the moment. So if you're angry, you read it anger because there's no personality attached to it. You have to assign one. There's no emotion attached to it. You have to assign it an emotion. So be very careful about what you send over the airways. Call them. Call them. I know texting's easy, and I know it's trendy, but it causes trouble. And car wrecks. If you look, when you text, like, need milk. I was going to say just hit K, but then you're offending somebody. Because you can't just hit K. 
And don't use capital letters because now you're screaming at me. <laughs> Sound familiar? No. Don't be offended over what comes on the airway. Huh? Don't end it with a period. I was taught to, to use punctuation properly. Well, see, I struggle with that. And I thought okay was okay. But apparently it offends. But now I'm mad. Now I'm not. That's, that's offensive. Okay. I saw I've been told. Okay. I'm, no, I'm okay with okay. But everybody's not. Back to the sun. <laughs> Lest we all become offended with each other. <laughs> know the word of God for yourself, please. So don't want anybody to answer me. Because I don't want to bring pride nor condemnation. But when was the last time you read your Bible? When was the last time you sat down and opened the word of God and read for yourself? I'm going to ask you this. Where's your Bible? Do you even know where it's at? Or would you have to go look for it? And if you found it, how much dust would you have to wipe off of it? I'm just asking. I'm, a, I'm, I'm asking for a friend. <laughs> what are you studying? What have you been studying in the Word of God? What, what? If I come up to you and say, hey, what have you been studying? Hugh, Brother Richard's brother. Yeah. Hugh would always come up to me. Hey, what you been studying? So, man, when I see Hugh <laughs> from across the room, I'm already thinking, man, what have I been studying? Because you got to ask me. <laughs> I got to have an answer. <laughs> I just tell him Mark 4. Mark 4. That's just... <laughs> 30 years of Mark 4. 30 years of Mark 4. You don't have Mark 4 down yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Where have you been reading in your Bible? What book of the Bible are you reading right now? I'm just throwing it out there, man. I, I'm, I'm not trying to bring condemnation nor pride. I'm just saying we ought to be in the Word. We ought, let me ask you this. What was the last meal you ate? When did, you, when did you eat last? Probably most of us can say either this morning or last night. And you can probably tell me exactly what it is and who cooked it. But God said, man, should I live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Brother Holston used to say we feed our body three hot meals a day and we feed our spirit one cold snack a week. And we expect to be spiritually strong. If you fed your body one can of beanie weenies a week, how strong would your body be? But we expect our spirit man to somehow be strong when it's... What if I... Well, I'm not going to use Natalie because I could live on her, live on her leftovers. But if, what if I was trying to live on... <laughs> the leftovers that somebody else ate. Well, if you're only coming and getting the only word you get is here, well, you're just getting the leftovers of what I've been chewing on all week. Study the word so that you're not deceived. Man, I drink a lot of coffee. I could come up here completely delusional one day and start saying stuff that's completely out of my mind on some kind of caffeine fit. And if you just receive what I'm speaking as truth, you misled. Study the word of God. Be able to say, man, pastor lost it. Because that ain't what God said. But sadly, I can stand up here and say, you know what the Bible says, and I can run off in a tangent, and a lot of people would not even notice. And they would just think that's what the Bible said. Ought not be. Stay in a church. Because like I said, some may leave here after today. I don't know. But if you do, stay in a church that teaches the unadulterated word of God, that doesn't compromise the truth just to tickle your ears. Amen. Amen. Don't let somebody tickle your ears. Man, 
The word of God ought to push us forward with a swift kick. And if it's not, the word's not challenging you. Come on. The word ought to be challenging you. It ought to be causing you to go somewhere, to move. <clears throat> the masses out there, listen, the masses out there, I'm talking about the, the majority of people. I'm talking about the majority of people who identify as Christians. I'm talking about the majority of people who go to church will pick a church that tickles their ears because it will make them feel good. Amen. Don't be like that. Do I want to beat you down? And No. God told me feed my sheep. He never told me to kick them. And if, if I go to kick and sheep, God's going to deal sternly with me. I'm not trying to do that, but I am going to try to feed you the truth of the word because that's the only thing that your spirit will thrive on. Listen to what God says, not what the news tells you. That's a huge one, man. Listen to what God says, not what the news tells you. And for darn sure, not what you read on Facebook. I hear people say that all the time, but it says it right here. Everybody's got access to that, and anybody can type something about anything or nothing, usually nothing. Don't take that as a fact. <laughs> I had to talk to Josh because he shares things that he thinks they're funny because they're so distant from the truth, it's comical. But when he would share it, people get offended and they say, I can't believe that happened. Well, it never happened. He's being silly. <laughs> And it's funny if you get it, but some people really think it's just true. Oh, dear God. That could never happen. Why are you offended at something that didn't and could never happen? But they're just looking. Where can I be offended today? There's some people out there, not in here, out there, those people that are addicted to drama. They're addicted, and I, I, I'm saying it's a real addiction because when they have the drama, there are chemicals that are released by their endocrine system that are dumped on their brain, and it gives them some type of euphoric high. And when the drama goes away, they're looking for the next fix, and that's becoming more and more and more and more pre uh, prevalent in our day. The day's coming. That's why. I like to cook, mainly because I like to eat. <laughs> I like to marinate meat, and I'll concoct marinades. You know why I do that? Because the meat will take on a flavor. So if you, if you, the, the longer you leave that meat soaking in that marinade, the more of the flavor it will absorb. The more you marinate in drama, the more you marinate in that junk out there, the more you marinate with the news turned on, I don't care if it's CNN or Fox, it don't matter. The more you marinate in it, the more you start to taste like that. We have to learn to marinate in the anointing of God. When was the last time you just sat in the anointing and said, God, I feel your presence right here so strongly. I don't even want to move, God. I just want to sit right here. I have nowhere else to go. Everything else in the world can wait because I'm just marinating in your presence. When was the last time? And don't look at me. It ain't my responsibility to set that atmosphere. It's yours because you can have that in your home. You can have that driving in your vehicle. You can have that in the shower. You can have that anywhere you want. You've got access to the very throne of God. And you can come into his presence and just marinate. And then you leave out of there rejuvenated and refreshed and sharing light. Look, 
You can marinate in all that other stuff. You can marinate for hours on Facebook. You ever seen people that they can't even put it down? It's like, it's been like two minutes since I saw what somebody posted or who commented on my post. I better check. And they marinate. And then when you talk to them, they taste like everything they've been reading. You follow me? I'm not trying to be offensive. I'm just trying to shine some light. We can't marinate in that mess. Am I against Facebook? No. Nope use it. I do. But I have to watch not only what I post, but mainly what I read. What am I marinating in? Because I could be in a great mood and open that and all of a sudden, stay away from me. I'm mad at the world. And I picked up somebody else's offense. I picked up an STD. I caught an STD right off of Facebook. A spiritually transmitted disease. And they're prevalent Don't absorb the flavor of it. Turn the news off, man. Turn it off. Do yourself a favor. Turn it off. You know, everybody complains about the fake news, the fake news, the fake news. You know how we fix that? Turn it off. Simple. Watch. I got all this power and authority. Click. You can't speak to me no more. Click. Shut up. Click. And if you do watch TV, talk to it. Better. Because your brain accepts as truth what it hears your mouth say. That's why a habitual liar believes his own lies. Because their brain hears their mouth say it, now all of a sudden the brain thinks it's true. So when it hears all this information coming in, it starts thinking that that's right. But if it hears your mouth say, that ain't right, well then your brain says, whoa, 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 I better not receive that. So if you go to watch it, talk to it. We, do we talk to it? All the time. Because we might be watching a show that's okay for us to watch and it's not giving us an STD, and we're watching it, and then a commercial comes on. And it says stuff that's crazy. It'll say stuff like, this is one of my favorites. Least favorite. Because addiction is a disease. Well, I, I, I get what you're saying, but the truth is, the truth is, you can quit addiction. Right? Mm -hmm. You can have an addiction and one day say, you know what? I'm not doing that no more. I've done it. I've seen other people do it. But I ain't seen somebody say, I'm done with cancer. I ain't doing it no more. I'm putting that down. I'm walking away. <laughs> right? Mm. I know. Here we go again. I'm going to get some more messages. <laughs> but it's okay. I don't have to get off on that. Don't marinate in that junk. Turn it off. The Bible breaks people down in two groups. How many does the world break us up into? We all fragmented, right? Everybody got their own group. I want my own group. I need my own group. I need a group of people like me. How entertaining would that be? All right. So the world breaks up into all these groups. God breaks up into two you want other two groups? It's not black. It's not white. It's, it's not, it's not whatever. It's not by, here's the Pentecostal, here's the Methodist, here's the Lutheran, here's the Catholic, here's the Baptist, here's the Presbyterian. That ain't how God breaks us up. He breaks up in two groups. Wise and fools. Pretty simple. Wise and fool. You know, and you can go through an a extensive search of scripture to determine who the wise ones are, and it all comes down to this. The wise one is who says that looks at the word of God, first of all, looks at the word of God, and then says the word of God is true. Because Jesus said, Father, thy word is truth. Therefore, I'm just going to accept everything that God said as truth. Everything my Bible says is truth. All the way, Pastor Mike says, all the way down to where it says genuine leather. I'm just believing it's genuine leather because my Bible says it, therefore it's true. All right? The fool says, no, it's not. It's not all true. 
I believe most of it. I believe some of it, or I believe none of it. But it doesn't matter. That's what separates the wise and the fools. So when you, when you turn on the news, who's talking to you? Someone that believes the word of God and is just telling you what God said? No. So why do you give your ear to a fool? Why do you give your ear to a fool? Y'all with me? Yeah. Would you let a fool speak into your life? Willingly let a fool speak into your life? Then don't let somebody who, who doubts the word or is out in outright defiance of the word speak into your life. What are they going to sow into your life that's profitable for you? <clears throat> the Bible says this. Says, what business does light have with darkness? Mm -hmm. Fellowshipping with darkness? So what business does the child of God have fellowshipping with fools? What business does God, the child of God have letting fools speak into their life? How about we get in the word of God and let the one who made it all and who knows the beginning from the end tell us what's going on. Does that sound good to you? I don't need someone else to tell me what's going on when I can go straight to God and I can let him tell me what's going on. So when I see everything going on in the world, I say, why, God? Well, I can hear a report of man that's going to tell me all these mysteries and call me to hate somebody. Or I can listen to God and say, oh, it must be because the day's coming. It must be because the day of the Lord is drawing near. Therefore, all this is taking place. So let it be an encouragement to you. Look up. Be thankful. Because your redemption draws nigh. Isn't that what the Word of God said? So don't let it get you beat down and discouraged and hating somebody and offended. Just be grateful. Because, Father, the day is coming. When I'm going home with my reward. What a day when I hear the trumpet of the archangel and Jesus split the eastern sky and the dead in Christ rise first and then we go to meet him in the air. How awesome. I don't want to miss the bus. I don't want you to miss the bus. First Corinthians 10, 1 through 6. Moreover, brother, I do not want you to be unaware, I want you to know, right, that all of our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea, all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, all ate the same spiritual food, all drank the same spiritual rock, for they drank of the spiritual rock, capital R, that followed them, and that rock was Christ. So who's Brother Paul talking about? Well, he's talking about the Hebrews. He's talking about the Jews that followed Moses out of bondage in Egypt, right? But he's talking about us. Because it goes on to say, let them be an example. Is that, you got another one after that, Tyler? Oh, there he is. But most of them, God was not, was not well pleased. For their bodies were scattered. In unity? Scattered in the wilderness. Now these things came, why? Why did that happen? For our example. To the intent that we should not lust after evil things like they did. Right? So he said, sort out with that brethren. So he's not talking to the world out there, but he's talking to the church. And he said, do not be unaware, but pay attention. Don't be oblivious to what's going on around you. That our fathers were led out of bondage in Egypt. What's that represent? They were slaves. God sent a deliverer. He led them out. What's that represent? It represents our salvation, right? Salvation. We were in bondage to our, to our sin. We were condemned. There was no way out. Then God sends a deliverer. His name was Jesus, right? And he led us out of our bondage. Then where did he lead them to? Where, where did Moses lead the people to? Didn't they pass through the sea? What's that represent? That represents our baptism, right? And then they go out. In pursuit of the promised land. That's the fulfillment of the promises of God. But somewhere in between, they had to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. And that's where things went crazy. <coughs> that's where 
in between the baptism, listen, and put yourself here, in between the baptism and the fulfillment of promise, there was a whole lot of them that were scattered. And I think that's where most of the body of Christ is. We're in between the baptism and the fulfillment, but all too often along the way, too many get scattered. That makes sense to you. It said, but they all ate the same spiritual food, and they all drank from the same rock. Well, the same spiritual food, that's the word of God, right? For us, for them, it was manna that fell from heaven. For us, it's the word of God, the written word. And they said they drank of the rock, capital R. For them, it was a literal rock that Moses put, went and touched, and rock, water flowed out of the rock, and the people drank. But for us, that's the presence of God. That's the anointing. That's the anointing of God. Y'all with me? Y'all Are y'all getting this? So he said they all had the same chance, just like you, just some made it and some were scattered. Don't be scattered. Don't be scattered. Be assembled. Be in unity. You know why most of them got scattered? They believed the report of a fool. That's, that's right. God said, go into the land and occupy it. But what did they do? They said, well, let's send some people in and scout it out. And then the scouts came back, and they didn't say what God said. They said what they saw, and everybody else freaked out, and they scattered. And they didn't even get to go into the promised land. They didn't even experience what God had for them. Some of their kids did, but they didn't. Because they believed the report of a fool. Don't believe the report of a fool. Find out what God says. For them, it meant physical death. For us, it could mean spiritual death, which is far worse. Physical death is temporary. Spiritual death is eternal. Right? It's vital. As we see the coming of the day of Jesus, that we're faithful to attend church. The devil, like I said, recognizes the importance of us being here together. So he does everything he can do to keep us apart. It's harder to deceive you when you're routinely in the Word of God. It's really hard. It should be really hard to find a good reason to miss church. The further we go on, the easier it becomes for us to find a reason. But it should be really hard for us to find a good reason to miss church. because it, 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 And if you're going to miss and you have a, a legitimate reason to miss, don't try to talk someone into, else into missing with you. Because you may, look, and it might be fun and you might be going and have a good time and <clears throat> look, that's all great. But when we invite people to come partake of whatever we're going to go do, and it means they miss church, what if you played a role in getting them away from church on the day that God had anointed to bring their deliverance or their healing or their salvation? I, I think like that. I want you to start thinking that way. Let's try to get them here, not try to get them away. Okay? Go with me on that? I'm saying that out of love. I'm not saying that. I'm not trying to bring condemnation. I'm not. I'm not. I'm just, what I'm saying is, let's let's do what we can to assemble together as a body of believers. Let's strengthen each other. Let's help each other. Let's encourage each other. Let's not pull each other to and fro. Let's build each other up. I'm not saying that because I'm the pastor. I'm saying that because I love us. I love you, and I want us to be a body that's. Together, I mean, in sync and, and operating and doing what God's called us to do. As we go forward, toward the approaching of the day of the Lord, it's more and more vital, it grows more and more vital that we assemble. It's vital. That we daily, look, when I say we, I'm, I'm putting me in there too. We is a part of me, right? That we daily survey our life 
and ask this question or these questions. Am I being seduced back into an old worldly pattern in my life? Can you look at your life today and look backwards and can you say I'm closer to God today than I've ever been or am I not as close as I once was? And if you say I'm not as close as I once was, I say why? It wasn't God. So are, are you reverting back to the way you were B.C., before Christ? Before you accepted Jesus as your Savior? Are you closer to him now than on that day? Or are you further back? Do you look more like the world than you used to? Then you have to ask yourself, do I spend more time marinating in the Word of God? Or the word of the world and the report of man. Because whatever I'm marinating in, I'm picking up the flavor of. I'm starting to taste just like it. So Jesus said, be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. Well, if somebody tastes of me, are they going to taste the salt of Jesus? Or are they going to taste that I just taste just like the rest of the world? Am I allowing fools to speak into my life? I'm not talking about conversation. I'm talking about speaking into your life. I'm talking about giving you advice. I'm talking about developing a way of thinking. I'm talking about am I taking what they say to heart? We can't ever silence the voice of a fool except from separating ourselves from them. But we can, no matter where we go, there's going to be voices. I'm talking about what are we listening to? Don't listen to a fool. Don't let people vomit in your ear. Would you let anybody come stick a phone in your ear and throw up in it? No, but we let them share their heart with us when it's full of all kind of deceit and vileness. And we somehow think that that's the Christian thing to do. Man, get, get, just, get, get, just get away from me. Go puke on somebody else, but I don't want that in my ear. Because I might pick up your offense. I'm far more concerned with catching a spiritual disease than I am COVID. Serious. Uh, I might have to wear my mask sometime to go into certain places because they require me. But it's so much more important that I have the shield of faith up when I'm ever I'm in public. Amen. I'm being honest with you. I may not. It may not make. It may not make me physically sick, or it may, but the outcome is way worse with a spiritual disease than a physical one. Because the worst a physical one could do is could kill my mortal body and then Jesus is going to raise me up anyway. But a spiritual disease could lead me into eternal destruction. Who am I allowing to speak into my life? Have I allowed offense into my life? Am I offended with anyone? Look, if you're offended, you, you need God to heal you. Because if not, you're going to be a bitter person. And you're going to be hard to be around. And you're going to offend others. And then Jesus said, whoa. He said, offense has come. But woe to the one who they came through. So we might say, I don't care if I offend who I offend. Well, Jesus said, woe to the one who they come through. Now, I'm not talking about the truth of the word. I'm talking about wrong attitudes and wrong ideas and wrong things that we say and we maybe we didn't even mean to offend them we just sharing our opinion and this is how I feel about it. well now they're offended and Jesus said whoa woe to you who that offense came through because, because now you divided my own body think about that would you ever intentionally sever the body of physical body of Jesus but when we create an offense that's exactly what we do. Have I allowed my love to grow cold? Do I love people the way Jesus told me to? Do I love people with the love of God? Do I? I have to look at myself and say, do I really love people? Or do I just act like everyone else? I've got to ask myself. You've got to ask yourself these questions because this is real. And we're going to stand before God one day. 
And the scary thing is, I'm going to stand before Jesus, and the revelation describes him as read the account of revelation of what Jesus looked like to John the Revelator. He said, fire coming from his eyes and a sword coming from his mouth. And, and I'm going to stand in front of him one day, and here's the scary part. And Natalie's not going to be there. It's just going to be me. Because right now, Natalie can step in and say, what he, what he meant to say was, and this is how he meant for it to be. And he, she can try to, she would justify me. But I'm going to stand in front of him one day without her. And I'm just going to have to sober him. I don't want to have to, to, to explain to him why I severed his body and separated his people because I brought an offense. I take this literal. I, I, this is real stuff. This isn't fairy tale dreamland. This is reality, and every one of us is going to stand before him one day. Am I letting the distractions of life keep me out of church? Because here's the reality. I talked about severing the body. When we're out of church, we bring separation to the body of Christ. You ever think about it like that? We're supposed to be in unity. But if we can't even gather together, when we put that swing set together for the kids, and it might have been a daunting task, but it came in a box and everything was, all the parts were compiled, but they weren't assembled. And we put it all together. But what if we had left the slide in the box and, and both swings in the box with the frames there? How useful. How useful is that? Not to the kid. I mean, we might be able to hang an engine from it or something, but... It's not going to fulfill its function. So we have to make sure the body of Christ is assembled. Amen? Amen. Hey, I love you. I love you. I don't like preaching like this. I, I want to preach about the blessing of God, the favor of God, the unmerited favor of the grace of God. But this is what he gave you. Right? 